This is BBC Two. Now, for the latest news on the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery, we go live to Cape Canaveral and Tim Sebastian. Discovery has begun its journey to the launch pad. Its next trip is into space. Good afternoon to you from Cape Canaveral, where we are anxiously awaiting news of whether the Space Shuttle Discovery is to fly. It's already been delayed an hour because of adverse weather conditions. This, you may remember, is a crucial flight for NASA, the first manned mission in 32 months since the Challenger accident. Much of America's prestige, pride, hopes and money running on this. As a NASA expert said earlier today, they are betting the future of the company on this launch. Well, the countdown is continuing. The hatch on the shuttle has now closed, and the preparations for the astronauts have been proceeding as they have been all day. Commander Rick Cobb, pilot, uh... Despite the delay, the five astronauts made their way out to the launch pad this morning, aware that they might not be flying at all. NASA had worked all night to fix last-minute problems on Discovery itself, but the weather proved more intractable. The surface winds are too high, the higher winds are too weak. The astronauts will not go unless conditions are perfect. A short time ago, NASA's chief administrator, James Fletcher, was asked how important today's mission was. Awfully important. Uh, we've waited two and a half years. We've fixed everything we know how to fix. Uh, the team is ready. The shuttle is in good shape. The probability of its working is very high. And if it doesn't work, that'd be a major disaster for NASA. But it'll work. You don't think you're being overly cautious? No, I don't think so, and especially not on this first flight. It's important that there be a minimum of anomalies on this first flight. And uh, we may relax some of the paperwork a little bit for succeeding flights, but uh, not really the constraints. We'll, we'll keep those uh, indefinitely. James Fletcher of NASA. Well, with me is John Pike of the Federation of American Scientists. John, I gather you've had the latest from NASA in the last few seconds. What are they saying? Well, uh, we're currently in a uh, pre-programmed hull. Uh, the normal plan is that they get to T minus nine minutes and then have at least a 30 minute this hull. Is nine minutes before launch. Nine, minute, nine minutes before launch. And then they hold the clock there, stop the clock for at least 10 minutes to allow everyone to take one last look at what the situation is before they start the clock running again. Now, as I said, normally this hold is going to last for 10 minutes, uh, but apparently uh, uh, some difficulties have arisen. Uh, the schedule is moving a bit slower than they had hoped, and so the hold is going to be at lasting at least 30 minutes. The big uh, question, of course, at this point is what's going to be happening with the weather? Uh, normally, uh, they expected the uh, shuttle to be encountering significant tailwinds, They've programmed the computers to compensate for those tailwinds, but uh, the weather's not cooperating, and the winds are just not blowing as strongly as they had anticipated. We're still within the so-called launch window. Um, how serious has this delay so far been? What are the, what are the potential well, dangers far, for it? Thus far, uh, this has been a, a relatively benign delay. There's no uh, suggestion of problems with any of the hardware. Uh, this is probably about the simplest type of problem they could be having. Uh, the thing that we're waiting for at this moment is the update from the latest weather balloon that they have sent up. Uh, on about an hourly basis, they've been sending up uh, these large weather balloons that uh, take about 45 minutes to reach an altitude of 100,000 feet uh, to tell them what the winds are at those altitudes. Uh, we're expecting that uh, the data from the most recent balloon is going to be relayed and analyzed sometime within the next few minutes or so and that could lead them to make a decision now as to whether 
they would be launching, uh, say, in about 40 or 45 minutes. If they don't like the results from uh, that weather balloon, they have several more that they're planning to release, and uh, we probably have another uh, two and a half hours or so before the window closes. The fundamental constraint that they're facing is that, of course, if something goes wrong during the launch, they want to have several airfields in Africa that they can land the orbiter uh, if they need to. The problem, of course, is that given the difference in time zones, it's uh, midday here, uh, getting on late afternoon in Africa, and uh, they want to have daylight at those African landing sites uh, uh, before they launch. And so in about two and a half hours, the sun's going to start going down in Africa, and uh, that'll be it. So for there the are some pressures. John Pike, thank you very much indeed. We'll be coming back to you a little later to hear from you and to hear the details from NASA. But let's just recall for a moment why, in fact, there is so much interest in today's launch. 32 months since the Challenger accident. Let's look back at some of the pressures that have affected NASA over this period in the immediate aftermath of the Challenger accident. <laughs> They were dismal days, a time of national mourning and broken dreams, a tragedy that so touched America that its people seemed frozen in grief. In New York, they dimmed the brightest of the lights. On Wall Street, they held a minute's silence. They were marking the loss not just of the shuttle and its astronauts, but of a symbol of US prestige. From the White House locked in snow, a promise that they would get it back. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. But before they could go anywhere, there was the official inquiry into Challenger, bitter and full of recriminations. NASA became the target of public anger, and the investigators began to share it. It's a kind of Russian roulette. It was a risk. You got away with it but it shouldn't be done over and over again. That comment to the space technicians and managers who were found to have ignored repeated warnings about the shuttle's inadequacies. On January the 28th, 1986, Challenger became the accident that had waited so long to happen. Go and throttle up. Roger, go and throttle up. Well, I think lots of people recognized its fragility and did not own up publicly to that recognition. Uh, the fact that there were problems in brakes, that the shuttle main engines kept failing and weren't coming anywhere near to their lifetime, uh, that, that uh, there were a number of problems throughout the system that could cause major accidents, I think was recognized by thoughtful people all along. But the whole mental set was to deny those problems and go on as if it were routine. No denial, though, could get away from the empty launch pad at Cape Canaveral. And even the most pessimistic experts had no idea of the staggering length of time it would take NASA to fly again. Only Moscow, it seemed, enjoyed the spectacle. The Soviets have recognized that, that for example, Western European scientists are anxious to fly their experiments, their instruments, and have come to Germany, to the UK, to France, and have said, uh, you want to fly? Come with us. We're flying. We will accommodate your, uh, your uh, wishes and your schedules. And why not? Why shouldn't they? Is America, once again, with, with the launch of the shuttle Discovery, is it once again guilty of putting its faith just in a single system? Well, the Air Force has diversified its launch fleet to buy small Titans, Deltas, Atlas. As a result of the Challenger accident? Yes, yes. I mean, it, they had already begun to buy a big alternative to the shuttle, the Titan IV, but they've added to that three other launch vehicles in the years uh, since the accident. NASA has not. It was NASA then that began retesting and redesigning with a vengeance. It didn't stop with the solid rocket boosters and the O-ring seals that had doomed the Challenger. The space agency took a look at everything. The more it probed, the more depressing the picture. 200 modifications had to be made to the orbiter, nearly 150 to the boosters. The accident bill approaching $20,000 million. 
What does a shuttle launch cost these days? Somewhere between 350 million and 500 million dollars, half a billion dollars every time we launch the thing. And is it still cheaper than putting up the payloads on Delta or Titan rockets? No, no. I mean that was the excuse. That yeah, the, the, the illusion. The, the illusion of cost effectiveness is gone forever. As discovery took shape at Cape Canaveral, NASA purged its senior officials. All but two of the men responsible for launching the Challenger have gone. The move was accompanied by glossy videos to show that the space agency was back on track and to ensure the money kept coming from Congress. There was help, too, from the president. We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States space program has been doing just that. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. The five crew members for today's mission have suffered more scrutiny than all the others, and they've spoken publicly and often of their concerns. Rick Houck, Discovery's commander. As you might imagine, we're all very sensitive now to exploring all of the questions that might revolve around the safety of the flight. And so I'm convinced this will be the safest flight we've flown. I think we've all, every individual in NASA and our contractors have uh, learned a terrible lesson and we will be very, very safe. Some people would say too safe. Uh, obviously the safest thing to do would be to never fly again, but then that's not what a space shuttle is for. NASA is looking today for a textbook launch to make up the losses of the last 32 months. Scientific experiments left undone, spy satellites left in the hangar. You can talk of dreams, and they do, but there's more to the shuttle than that. And the Americans know this one must succeed. Well, this launch is an immense psychological event for NASA. It has to be successful for the organization to make any claim to long-term viability. The, the company is being bet on the success of this launch. Then NASA can begin to stand tall again. It has to get this burden off its back. It has to prove that it can once again do the task that it failed at in 1986. Well, there it is. We can see the hatch of Discovery now, which has closed, closed in the last half hour. What a long time, John Pike, it's taken to get the shuttle rebuilt, to get it off its knees and standing up in a position where it can now get into space. Well, certainly at the time of the Challenger accident, people were speaking of the shuttle being grounded per, for perhaps six months or a year or so. Uh, but if you go back and look at the history of the manned space program, both the American program and the Soviet space program, it's very clear that any time you lose a crew in the way NASA did with the Challenger accident, that it results in a top-to-bottom reevaluation of management procedures and hardware. Uh, when the uh, Apollo 204 fire killed three American astronauts back in 1967, it was almost two years before NASA uh, flew Apollo again. The Soviets, of course, lost. Let's see what we have coming up here. Launch control, a tense time for them, obviously. The shuttle, of course, is worth recalling this date, this launch date, has been delayed five times, hasn't it? So they've got themselves well, they've got a lot, to this quite clear, a few times. They've clearly got a lot riding here, of course. Uh, uh, given the uh, immense amount of preparation that's gone into uh, this flight, an additional delay of a few days uh, certainly wouldn't be out of the ordinary. The uh, Soviets, uh, despite their very impressive flight rate uh, on the two occasions that they've lost crews, have also grounded their vehicles for about two years. You mentioned the changes in manpower, changes in modification. Um, we've seen an enormous purge, actually, in NASA, haven't we, over the last two and three quarter years? In fact, all but two of the officials who were responsible for the launch of the Challenger have moved on, haven't they? Well, uh, uh, it is very clear that one of the uh, major criticisms that the Roger Commission, which investigated, uh, which investigated the accident, concluded that there did need to be a change in uh, top management. And uh, there has been a major turnover. Uh, in particular, uh, the astronauts have been given much greater responsibility in running the shuttle program 
to uh, increase the safety of it. Well, we are in uh, a nine-minute hold at the moment. We're waiting for news from NASA. NASA has sent up the weather balloons to see what sort of data is coming back, whether the conditions are going to improve enough to allow them to launch later on today. We will, of course, be updating you in our bulletins on BBC One later on. But for now, from all of us here at Cape Canaveral, back to London. It weighs approximately 5,000 pounds and spans 50... Now on BBC Two, the national news from Lisa Davidson. Joining ITN for a space shuttle update. The space shuttle Discovery is still on the pad at Cape Canaveral, unlaunched. And NASA now admits that there would be no prospect of a launch for at least another half an hour. The countdown is at nine minutes and holding, but they still have tests to continue, and they are also making an evaluation of the latest news from the weather balloon. So, no chance of a launch for at least another half an hour. Lawrence McGinty reports on the latest activity. Led by flight veteran Rick Houck and showing no signs of nerves, the crew of Discovery left for their craft more than three hours ago. They had a spring not only in their heels as they suited up in the white room before entering the hatch into Discovery. But for all their obvious optimism, the weatherman had bad news. Weather balloons had shown peculiarly light winds in the upper atmosphere and the computers that fly the shuttle couldn't cope. About 35 minutes ago, the ground crew closed Discovery's hatch after putting new 5-amp fuses in the fans on board that keep the crew cool. In ground control, frustration that Discovery is A-OK, -okay, but the weather is keeping it on the ground. And Ken Reese at the Cape. Ken, your latest. Well, we do have a little bit of good news, Alistair. The latest data from the last weather balloon sent up is showing that the winds in the upper atmosphere, which were causing the problems, are now right on the margin. They could possibly fly. They're poring over that data right now, trying to make that final decision. Meanwhile, as you said, the count is stopped at nine minutes. They could go possibly in half an hour from now. They have a launch window extending for two and a half hours from now. So there's just a little bit of cautious optimism. I see some clouds building up behind you, Ken, which weren't there earlier this afternoon. Is that going to be a problem? At the moment, no, because as the clouds get nearer the land mass here, it's very, very hot, as you may be able to see. It's nearly 90 degrees. They're dissipating, so that has not proved a problem so far. All right, well, we hope there won't be any more problems. Thank you, Ken. Let's hope so. And now, Colonel uh, Jack Glausmer, former shuttle commander. You must be disappointed, but it's right to get it right. It's right to get it right, and I think the crew is saying about the same thing. They're saying, let's go, we need to be on with this. We've been training for months and even years, but let's do it right when we do. And uh, I think their thoughts are turning inward now. They're jocular on the outside, but they're focusing what they need to do. And, and so some of what we've seen so far is a little deceptive as to how they're really thinking and what they're getting ready to do. So what would you be saying and thinking now if you were in the orbiter? If I were in the orbiter now, I would be thinking that the odds are pretty good that we're going to go. I saw Dan Brennenstein, the chief astronaut, take off in the shuttle training airplane to check the approaches to the runway there. In case they have to return to the launch site, they want to make sure that the approaches are clear of clouds and the weather's good enough, and he'll make that uh, report. And so it looks like to me that optimism is prevailing, and, uh, and I'm sure the crew is glad to hear that as well. Well, it may just be half an hour. Well, we shall see, and of course we'll have reports uh, of the shuttle discovery and we hope it's uh, lift off back into space uh, on the news at 545 the channel 4 news at 7 and on news at 10 but at the moment discovery is still on the launch pad likely to stay there for at least another half an hour but there are still prospects that she can get away today and no doubt that will be of great importance to the crew who've been waiting so long good afternoon good discovery on the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. The NASA authorities are still checking over reports from the various sections. They had been aiming to go for a launch at 4.30 this afternoon, a revised launch time. 
but they have still not yet made that decision. Of course, we'll keep you up to date as and how things go. And now, okay, well, that's, uh, that's the uh, end of this news update. Back to Children's ITV. Latest news on the preparations for the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery, we go live to Cape Canaveral and Tim Sebastian. Welcome back to Cape Canaveral. We have good news in the last few minutes. After a delay this morning of an hour and a half, the full team of launch controllers have said that the shuttle discovery will fly. We heard them wishing the five-man crew now inside the shuttle godspeed and good luck. The launch, of course, of the first U.S. manned mission in 32 months, 32 months since the Challenger disaster. Well, with me is John Pike from the Federation of American Scientists. John, it's taken a long time to get here. It now looks as though they're going to go, doesn't it? Well, when uh, we came out of the nine-minute hold, there was a uh, cheer that went up uh, throughout the press area here. And now that we're less than five minutes away from launch, I think that the tension is certainly mounting here. It looks like after uh, 32 months of being grounded, after a number of delays, after uh, certainly a great deal of soul searching, uh, re-evaluating where we're going in space and it looks like we're uh, just about to get back in space again. Of course the watchword here has been safety all along right through these 32 months and indeed for the last 48 hours. How safe can one of these missions possibly be? Well it's very difficult to say. Obviously it's an extremely uh, complicated machine but uh, I think that they've made it as safe as they can. Well we see Discovery there, the final checks. And what is that? We're seeing the fin of the orbiter. There were some questions about its safety earlier today about the orbital maneuvering system. NASA engineers worked all night to correct that, but it does seem as though they did it just in time. We're coming up on the three minute point in the count. At Let's just listen to five seconds. The start of the external tank liquid oxygen pressurization will begin. Three minutes and counting. Uh, and the gaseous nitrogen purges of the main engines will be terminated. Go for ETLO2 pressurization. The ground launch sequencer has started to retract the gaseous oxygen vent hood or beanie cap on the external tank. John Pike, what is going on actually inside the shuttle at this moment? Well, they are uh, going through all of their checklists to uh, make sure that everything is ready to go. The main, essentially what's happening right now is that slowly but surely uh, they are disconnecting the uh, shuttle from all of its ground support. Uh, they've turned on the internal power, and here you see they're uh, disconnecting the so-called beanie cap on top of the external Coming tank that's used to capture the uh, liquid, hi the gaseous uh, hydrogen and oxygen that is vented off the top of the orbiter, uh, external tank. T minus two minutes and counting. This is, of course, something of a test flight, isn't it? They've carried out 200 modifications to the orbiter itself, about 145 to the booster. Um, none of these, of course, flight tested. Some of the risks attached to this, John Pike? Well, certainly, in a very real sense, NASA has uh, redesigned, redeveloped the shuttle, and they're literally learning to fly it all over again. So here we're coming up, I guess, on about the one-minute mark. T-minus 90 seconds and counting. Less than two minutes away from the launch of STS-26. Let's listen to the count as NASA goes through it. And we have heard that the clock will hold at 31 seconds. STDSD, it's a cabin pressure rated tank. Okay, copy. We are anticipating the clock will hold at T-minus 31 seconds due to a failure. We have not heard what that is yet. It's going down. John Pike, we've just heard a failure. They are going to hold the count at 31 seconds before liftoff. What could this be? Well, the 31-second uh, point is very critical because this is the point at which they go uh, uh, to automatic launch sequence. Clear the air and proceed. Let's go back. Let's go back to NASA. From the launch director to proceed. And if we clear, we will not stop at 31. Is that true? That's correct, MCD. We will not stop the clock. Uh, the orbiter computers have positioned the vent doors. Uh, T minus it looks like we're going. 31 seconds. We have a goal for auto sequence start. Very good. Discovery's four redundant computers have assumed. T minus 23 seconds and counting. The SRB nozzle profile. 
T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. We're go for main entrance start. Seven, six, start. Three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. Liftoff. Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. Roger roll, Discovery. Crew confirms roll program. Houston now controlling. Three inches at 104 percent. Three engines at 104 percent. Velocity 3,200 feet per second. Altitude 10.8 nautical miles. Downrange distance 8 nautical miles. At 25 seconds from solid rocket booster separation. One minute 45 seconds. Three engines at 104 percent. Velocity 4,800 feet per second, altitude 20 nautical miles, downrange distance 19 nautical miles. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Very good. Solid rocket boosters have separated. Tom Pike, we seem to have passed the psychological barrier. What a magnificent sight this was. You can hear the crowd in the background cheering. This has been a very emotional moment for everyone involved, very clearly. The redesign of the solid rocket motors apparently did succeed in this flight. And the solid rocket boosters have now finished their task, haven't they? Right, they'll be falling back to the sea uh, where they'll be recovered downrange. We'll be hearing some call-ups here shortly from the Capcom about the capability to reach transatlantic sites. Velocity 6,200 feet per second, altitude 41 nautical miles, downrange distance 60 nautical miles. Tom Pike looked very much like a textbook launch, that, didn't it? Well, after such a long wait. Well, after 32 months on the ground to see the uh, solid rocket motors firing, firing successfully, separating, uh, to get through that very important 73-second psychological barrier, uh, clearly, clearly a major step to getting America back in space. Uh, we've still got about four minutes before they actually reach orbit. Uh, the uh, liquid motors on the orbiter fire for a little more than eight minutes. Uh, but it looks like we have a successful mission so far. This, as we said earlier, was very much of a test flight. Uh, NASA, at least the launch controllers, the mission controllers in Houston, must be very, very relieved at this point. Well, of course, uh, we still have a number of abort contingencies that are being looked at as uh, they continue to fire the liquid motors, and I think that until they've established that orbit, it'll be a little too soon to say that it's completely successful, but we certainly passed a major threshold here. I think it's important to recognize the extent to which NASA is literally learning all over again how to build this vehicle, how to operate it, and how to fly it. And after 32 months on the ground, seeing that launch was a tremendous lift. I suppose the major achievement is to have got it up there at all, but let's look very quickly at what it'll actually be doing. The mission is going to last four days. What's the main point of this? 
Well, obviously the main point of the mission was simply to fly it again. Uh, they're going to be deploying a NASA communications satellite that will be used to relay data from the space shuttle as well as uh, upcoming major astronomical missions such as the Hubble Space Telescope. They also have a number of uh, smaller scientific experiments on board the orbiter, uh, primarily looking at uh, materials processing and the microgravity of outer space. But the main uh, purpose of this mission was clearly to demonstrate that the shuttle is once again flight worthy. Uh, and it's uh, looking like, at least in that respect, uh, that they're very close to success. Very briefly, did they lose a lot in the 32 months of grounding? Clearly, the credibility they're shooting for, it's a 105-mile orbit. They're trying for 160. The Preston Eco call will say that they can make it to uh, their hoped-for orbit of 160 miles with two engines and one fail. Discovery, Preston Eco, Group Banjul, 109. Roger. Crew given their press to main engine cutoff call, indicating they can receive they can uh, proceed to normal main engine cutoff on two engines if that were to become necessary. But if they have to go to Banjul, performance nominal. They can still go to Roger nominal. Banjul with 100 percent power as opposed to 109 percent power. But uh, they want to get to orbit, even if it's a depressed orbit. But uh, they're going. It's 10 seconds. Velocity 1300. 13,900 feet per second, altitude 68 nautical miles, downrange distance 323 nautical miles. They're just leaving the atmosphere. Single engine Banjul 104. Roger. That call-up indicates uh, Discovery could achieve a uh, single engine uh, landing at uh, uh, Banjul if that were to become necessary. Banjul, one of the transatlantic uh, abort sites. They're now in space still accelerating upward, but the sky is black now, just turned for, from a very, very beautiful deep blue to black as they went past 68 or 70 miles. 50 seconds, velocity 16,400 feet per second, altitude 66 nautical miles, downrange distance 405 nautical miles. It's about as high as they're going to get for now. Their nose is uh, pulled down below the horizon so they can accelerate. They can see the horizon upside down now out their window. And the uh, spacecraft will now accelerate very rapidly, and cutoff will be about eight minutes and 31 seconds. But we will hear them update that. The reports soon. Uh, good navigation aids, and uh, main engine cutoff will, is expected at 8:33. 8:33. So that's right on the button. 104. Right on the button. Now this is highly critical, and of course the external tank has to fall away at this time. At 8:33, the uh, external tank must be jettisoned. Velocity 20,000 feet per second, altitude 61 nautical miles, downrange distance 527 nautical miles. The fuel cells are good, electric power. To maintain 3 Gs. The engines throttle back so that it doesn't uh, accelerate to more than three times the force of gravity forward in order to prevent uh, severing the connection between the tank and the shuttle. And so what did you feel and say at this time? I said we almost are there, but keep running. <laughs> keep going. Preparing now for the main engine cutoff. That's the Miko that you've been talking about. Due at 8 minutes 33 seconds into the flight. And so we can, I think, conclude up to now that the flight, the 26th mission of the shuttle, that the discovery is now looking good and going well, and that the United States has, as President Reagan was saying, returned to space where he said America remains to stay. And all depends on the success of this mission by discovery and what somebody have called the rather fragile cargo of hope that it's carrying. Good afternoon.